Some of the craters and mountains on Pluto's largest moon, Charon, have been officially named. Up until July 2015, Pluto's largest moon, Charon, was just a pixel in terms of what we actually knew about it. Well, that all changed when NASA's New Horizons spacecraft set off through space to analyze the planet, revealing craters, deep crevices, valleys, and mountains on the distant moon, surface features that now have formal names. From a mountain named after Stanley Kubrick to a crater named for Captain Nemo. Say so they have found the strongest sign yet of possible life beyond our solar system. At the frozen edge of our solar system, nearly 6 billion kilometers from the sun, a tiny world of ice and rock traces a lonely path through the darkness. For decades, we knew it only as a faint point of light, the ninth and most mysterious planet, Pluto. But this world was not alone. It held a secret, a ghost that haunted our earliest images, a flaw in our photographs that once understood would not only reveal a companion world, but would also shatter our understanding of what it means to be a planet and a moon. This is the story of a world discovered by accident, a world that cracked itself open from the inside out, a world that wears a mysterious red stain gifted from its larger twin. This is the story of Charon. Join me today as we journey to the solar system's greatest double act and uncover the violent, frozen, and deeply interconnected history of Pluto's shadow self. Accidental discovery. The story of Charon begins not with a deliberate search, but with a mistake. On the 22nd of June, 1978, James Christie, an astronomer at the US Naval Observatory, was performing a routine but tedious task, examining photographic plates of Pluto to refine calculations of its orbit around the Sun. The images, taken with the 1.5-meter Cadstrand telescope in Arizona, were not considered high quality. In fact, several plates had been marked as poor or defective because they showed Pluto not as a clean, sharp dot, but as a strangely elongated blob with a distinct bulge on one side. To most, this would have been an annoyance, an imperfection to be discarded. Atmospheric turbulence or improper telescope alignment could easily cause such distortions. But Christie had a specific background that prepared him to see something others had missed. He had spent years photographing double stars, and his trained eye recognized a familiar pattern in the strange bulge. He noticed a critical detail. While Pluto's image was smeared, the distant background stars on the very same plates were perfect, sharp points of light. If the problem were with the telescope or the atmosphere, everything in the image would be distorted. The fact that only Pluto was affected meant the bulge had to be real. There was something else there. Christie began a deep dive into the observatory's archives, unearthing plates of Pluto from as far back as 1965. Many of these, too, had been dismissed as flawed, bearing notes like Pluto image elongated. But now, these failures became the key to confirmation. Christie saw that the bulge systematically moved around Pluto over time. He and his colleague, Robert Harrington, meticulously tracked its position across the years of archived images. They calculated that the bulge circled Pluto once every 6.4 days, a significant number, because it perfectly matched Pluto's own known rotation period. This was the final piece of the puzzle. The ghost on the photographic plate was a massive companion, a moon locked in a synchronous dance with its parent world. With the discovery confirmed, the new moon was provisionally designated S1978P1. As the discoverer, Christie had the right to propose a name. He chose to name the new moon after his wife Charlene, whose nickname was Char, inspired by his interest in physics, where particles like protons and electrons often end in minor on. He added the suffix to create Charon. It was a personal tribute, but by an almost unbelievable coincidence, it was also a perfect mythological fit. Only after proposing the name did Christie learn that in Greek mythology, Charon was the silent spectral ferryman who carried the souls of the dead across the river Acheron into the underworld, the realm ruled by the god Pluto. The name was officially adopted by the International Astronomical Union in 19... Its very existence would force a complete re-evaluation of the entire solar system, and in doing so, would help topple Pluto from its planetary throne, the Pluto-Charon system. System. The discovery of Charon immediately began to unravel Pluto's mysteries and the first revelation was a profound one. By tracking Charon's orbit, 
astronomers could finally apply Kepler's law to calculate the mass of the system for the first time. The result was shocking. Pluto was not a small terrestrial planet, as some had thought, but was incredibly lightweight, about a sixth of the mass of Earth's moon. Charon itself was found to possess a substantial 12% of Pluto's mass, a ratio far greater than any other major moon in the solar system. Earth's moon, by comparison, is only about 1.2% of Earth's mass. This startling parity in size gives rise to a unique dynamic that sets the pair apart from every other planet, moon system. When a small moon orbits a large planet, the center of their combined mass, the barycenter, lies deep within the planet. The moon makes a large orbit around this point, while the planet makes a tiny wobble. But Pluto and Charon are so close in mass that their barycenter lies in the empty space between them, approximately 960 kilometers above Pluto's surface. Pluto and Charon perform a perpetual dance around a common, invisible point in space, and that has profound implications. Our moon is tidally locked to Earth. That means it rotates on its axis in the same amount of time it takes to orbit us, which is why it always presents the same face to us. From the moon's surface, however, an astronaut would see Earth rotate, going through a full day-night cycle. The Pluto-Charon system is an extreme example of what is called mutual tidal locking. Not only does Charon always show the same face to Pluto, but Pluto also always shows the same face to Charon. If you were standing on the Charon-facing side of Pluto, the Great Moon would hang motionless in the sky, a colossal disk that never rises or sets. If you were on the opposite hemisphere, you would never know it was there at all. They are locked in an eternal stare-down across 19,640 kilometers of space. These two facts, the external barycenter and the mutual tidal lock, led many scientists to argue that the system shouldn't be considered a planet and its moon, but rather a double planet. This ambiguity became a central exhibit in the heated debate over planetary definitions in the early 2000s. The discovery of Charon provided the critical data, Pluto's low mass and the system's strange dynamics that forced astronomers to confront the fact that the solar system was more complex than our simple categories allowed. The International Astronomical Union even formally considered a proposal to classify Pluto and Charon as a double planet in 2006. Though the idea was ultimately set aside amidst the larger, more controversial decision to reclassify Pluto as a dwarf planet instead. The kiss and capture theory, some so I know you're all wondering how did such a strange system come to be. For many years, the leading theory for the formation of the Pluto-Charon system was a scaled-down version of how our own moon was born, the giant impact hypothesis. In this scenario, a massive Kuiper Belt object slammed into a proto-Pluto in a cataclysmic collision. The impact would have blasted a huge cloud of debris into orbit, which then gradually coalesced to form Charon. This model successfully explains the system's high angular momentum and Charon's nearly circular orbit. However, as our understanding of planetary materials and our computational power grew, this model started to show cracks. Pluto and Charon are not molten bodies of rock like early Earth. They are small, rigid worlds made of rock and a great deal of water, ice. These materials behave very differently under the stress of a cosmic collision. More recent and sophisticated simulations have given rise to a new, more elegant theory. This model proposes a much lower velocity, grazing impact, less of a planetary shattering, and more of a cosmic kiss. Instead of obliterating each other, the Proto-Pluto and Proto-Charon collided gently enough that they became temporarily stuck together, spinning through space as a single, snowman-shaped object for a few hours before tidal forces pulled them apart again. They separated, but not completely, remaining forever bound by gravity in the binary system we see today. This kiss and capture scenario has a powerful advantage over the giant impact model. It explains how both bodies could have survived the encounter largely intact, preserving much of their original internal structure and composition. This aligns perfectly with observations showing that Pluto is denser and more rock-rich, about 70% rock, than Charon which is only about 55% rock, suggesting they formed as separate bodies that were not thoroughly mixed together in a fiery collision. Crucially, this formation story does more than just explain the system's orbit and composition. 
It provides the key to understanding Charon's entire geological history. The initial impact, and more importantly, the immense tidal friction generated as the two bodies stretched and pulled on each other during their separation, would have deposited a tremendous amount of heat deep inside both worlds. This injected energy is the starter pistol that fired off Charon's geological evolution. Trapped beneath a crust of ice, this heat would melt the interior, creating a subsurface ocean and setting the stage for the planetary-scale drama that would later unfold across its surface. Figuring out Charon and Pluto's relationship was something of a logic puzzle. The pieces were all there. We just needed to figure out how to decode them, and when we did, it was hugely rewarding. For 37 years after its discovery, Charon remained little more than a fuzzy companion to Pluto. But on the 14th of July, 2015, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft flew past the binary pair, transforming them from distant points of light into vibrant, complex worlds. The images New Horizons sent back from Charon were stunning. They revealed a world that had, at some point in its distant past, torn itself apart. Charon's surface. Charon's surface isn't smooth. It's dominated by a system of vast tectonic faults, enormous ridges, towering cliffs, and deep valleys that scar its surface. The most spectacular of these is a great belt of chasms that wraps around the moon's equator. This system, which includes the informally named Serenity Chasma, runs for at least 1,800 kilometers and plunges to depths of up to 7.5 kilometers. To put that in perspective, it's more than four times as long and nearly five times as deep as Earth's Grand Canyon. These are not canyons carved by rivers, but colossal pull-apart faults Evidence that the entire crust of Charon was once stretched to its breaking point. What immense force could cause a whole world to expand and rupture? The answer lies with the heat from its formation. That initial energy, supplemented by the slow decay of radioactive elements in its rocky core, was likely enough to melt the water ice deep inside Charon, creating a vast liquid water ocean beneath a solid, frozen crust. For a time, Charon was an ocean world, but all small bodies in the outer solar system eventually lose their primordial heat to space. As Charon cooled over millions of years, this subsurface ocean began to freeze. Here, a peculiar property of water becomes critically important. Unlike most substances, which contract when they freeze, water expands. As the ocean turned to ice, its volume increased, pushing relentlessly outwards on the brittle, overlying crust from below. The surface stretched and strained until it could hold no longer. The crust of Charon ruptured, creating vast canyon systems that still span the dwarf planet today. As one scientist put it, Charon tore itself apart at the seams, like Bruce Banner becoming the Hulk. Today, Charon appears to be geologically inert. Its period of great upheaval is long past, because it lacks a thick atmosphere or ongoing geological activity to erode or bury these features. The evidence of this ancient cataclysm is well preserved. The surface of Charon is not just a landscape, it is a frozen snapshot of the death of its ocean. Cry volcanoes on Charon. The freezing of Charon's ocean did more than just break its crust. It also paved over half the world. The New Horizons images revealed a tale of two hemispheres with dramatically different histories. The Northern Hemisphere, informally named Ozterra, is an ancient battered world with rugged, high-standing terrain. Heavily cratered and crisscrossed by the vast network of tectonic faults and canyons created by the expanding interior. This is the original crust of Charon, frozen in its fractured state. But to the south, the landscape transforms. This is Vulcan Planitia, a vast, smooth plain that's starkly different from the tortured lands of the north. This region is far less cratered indicating that it is a much younger surface. It sits at a lower elevation than Oz Terra, and its surface is marked by features that look like frozen flows and broad swells. Scientists believe Vulcan Planitia is one of the most extensive examples of cryovolcanism in the solar system. These weren't volcanoes of molten rock, but icy slush. As the subsurface ocean froze, the expansion not only cracked the crust, but also pressurized the liquid water below, which was likely mixed with ammonia that acted as a sort of antifreeze. This pressurized cryomagma was forced upwards through the newly formed cracks and fissures erupting onto the surface. 
Icy lava flooded the southern hemisphere, creating the smooth young plains of Vulcan Planitia. Scattered across these plains are several large isolated mountains, such as Kubrick Mons, which appear to sit in strange depressions or moats. These may be colossal blocks of the older northern crust that broke off, were carried along like icebergs on the cryovolcanic flows, and were left stranded as the plains froze solid around them. Mordor Macula, Charon's red spot, Perhaps the most visually arresting and mysterious feature on Chiron is its North Pole. Capping the top of the moon is a large, dark, reddish-brown stain, a feature so prominent that the New Horizons team informally named it Mordor Macula, after the Black Land from the Lord of the Rings. The color is almost certainly caused by a class of complex organic molecules called tholins. Tholins are a reddish, tar-like substance formed when simple organic compounds, particularly methane, are irradiated by the sun's ultraviolet light and cosmic rays. Tholins are common in the outer solar system, but their concentration at Charon's pole is unique. The key to understanding why they are here is to find the source of the methane. There are two competing theories. The leading hypothesis is that the methane is a gift from Pluto and its atmosphere, rich in nitrogen and methane, that's slowly escaping into space. As Charon orbits, its gravity captures some of this lost gas. During Charon's long, dark polar winter, which lasts for more than a century, temperatures plummet to below minus 240 degrees Celsius. At these extreme temperatures, the captured methane freezes directly onto the surface, in a process known as cold trapping. When the pole finally swings back into sunlight, the accumulated methane ice is bombarded with UV radiation, which cooks it into the reddish tholins that stain the pole. Charon and Pluto are then a dynamic, interconnected system, with one world actively painting the surface of its companion across thousands of kilometers of space. But a competing theory suggests the methane was an inside job, that it originated from Charon's own interior. The massive cryovolcanic eruptions that formed Vulcan Plantitia would have also released enormous quantities of gases, including methane, that were dissolved in the subsurface ocean. This would have created a temporary atmosphere on Charon, and just as in the first hypothesis, methane would have migrated to the coldest parts of the moon, the poles, and frozen out. Over billions of years, this native methane deposit was then irradiated to form Mordor Macula. This theory elegantly ties the origin of the polar cap directly to the other major geological events that shaped the moon. Whether the methane came from Pluto's atmosphere or Charon's own interior, Mordor Macula is a visible testament to the inescapable connection between these two distant worlds, a direct product of their shared history and environment. What Charon has taught us, our journey began with a smudge on a photographic plate that was nearly dismissed as an error. It ends with a complex and dramatic world, a world of continent-spanning canyons deeper than any on Earth, vast plains of ancient ice lava, and a mysterious red-stained pole. It's impossible to tell the story of Pluto without Charon. It was Charon's orbit that gave us the first true measure of Pluto's mass, revealing it as the king of a new class of worlds. It was Charon's existence that pointed to a shared, violent birth that sculpted both bodies and injected them with the heat that would fuel their evolution. It's Charon's fractured surface that tells a story of a lost ocean, a geological history that provides a crucial context for understanding the forces that may still be churning deep inside the more active Pluto today. And it's Charon's red pole that may serve as a permanent record of Pluto's atmosphere, bleeding out into space over the eons. In mythology, Charon the Ferryman was an inseparable and essential figure in Pluto's realm. Science has revealed this to be profoundly true. Charon is not a moon orbiting a dwarf planet. It is the other half of a unique binary system, forever locked in a silent, eternal dance with Pluto. Its story is a powerful reminder that our greatest discoveries can hide in our mistakes, and that even the most distant, frozen, and seemingly quiet corners of our solar system hold histories more fiery and dramatic than we could ever imagine.